Hi, Mark Jager here from JagerPhoto.com. Welcome to part two of a series of video aimed at helping beginning photographers run their DSLR camera. In part one of this series, I addressed using a mid-level DSLR in program mode, essentially full auto, point and shoot. Hopefully you did some homework and exercise your camera so the knowledge from part one is now firmly in place. In this part two, we will go to the next level of detail where we'll we will explore autofocus, exposure metering, use of live view, ISO, aperture priority versus shutter priority photography. If you haven't already, please hit that subscribe to button in the lower right hand corner of the screen. At the request of several viewers, I've provided links below that provide a reasonable view of the gear I use. The links will direct you to cameras and lenses, studio gear, video gear, and some miscellaneous equipment. The links all go to B&H, my vendor of choice. It's really easy to shop these days, but over roughly 30 years, I've found B&H to be 100% reliable with respect to making things right. Usually everything is straightforward and easy, but when the train jumps the tracks, a vendor that takes care of you is huge. Feel free to shop the links and or browse after you're at B&H. You will probably find something that helps you. Oh, I almost forgot. Be sure to check the link for this week's specials at B&H. Modern DSLRs are highly sophisticated optical devices. The film era guys had a lot of things to keep track of and no help from the internal computers. Your camera has a computer-like menu system for its controls that is much like the menu system in computer application programs like Word or Excel. There are high-level menu items, sub-menu items, and sometimes sub-sub-menu items that you can select in order to achieve your desired setup. I will not address every single menu item. In fact, we're going to skip a lot of them. But if you think about your camera as being a computer with a menu driven system and a lens in front of it, you won't be far from correct. Let's begin. Almost all DSLRs today can autofocus. They can also be manually focused. You can choose how the camera will autofocus. First, do you want the camera to focus once for a stationary object or continuously focus for a moving subject. Let's check our camera. We want to set the cameras to autofocus single. In many cases, this is the selection when the camera default mode is selected. We can check by pressing the autofocus button followed by rotating the main command dial. You can see the result in the top and back displays. It will indicate AFS or AFC. Stop rotating when it says AFS. Here's the AF button right over here. The info button here will make the display and you can see the information. Next, we get to choose the points that the camera will use for its focusing decisions. For a Nikon D7100, the choices are single point, where a single focus point is selected from the available points. Focusing will be based on that point only. Dynamic area uses either 9, 21, or 51 point matrices to focus. The center point is the best point to achieve focus, but if the subject moves, focusing will occur on the surrounding points. Use a greater number of points for moving subjects. 3D tracking starts by putting the focus point on the subject. In AFC mode, the camera will track the subject and use neighboring focus points to maintain the focus on the subject. Group area. The camera focuses using a group of focus points, or reducing the tendency sometimes of the camera to focus on the background instead of the subject when the subject is moving. If faces are detected in AFS mode, the camera will give priority to face or portrait subjects.
auto area. The camera automatically detects the subject and then selects the focus point. If a face is detected, priority will be given to the focus on the face. I've been using live view mode here, using the LCD on the back of the camera to show the info panel, which is the summary of the current settings. The summary is very useful when you were last doing something off normal and you want to make sure that you have all of your desired settings. You can look at the back screen very quickly and see what you've got. You can choose to use the viewfinder or live view mode to compose your shots. Each method has its applications. Live view is engaged and disengaged with this button right here. The choice of focusing points is made by pressing the AF button and then rotating the subcommand dial. The available choices are, as we said, single, dynamic 9, dynamic 25, and dynamic 51, 3D, and then auto. For now, select auto area for focusing on your camera. Watch the back LCD here in live view mode. First using single point focus where I will demonstrate how with the multi selector I can move the focus point around the screen. Once you've moved to the position of choice, press the shutter button halfway to focus. Manual focus is a skill you should practice. While the camera's autofocus mechanism is very good, there will be certain conditions where manual focus will be necessary. Manual focus is often required in low light conditions. It is certainly necessary for astrophotography, where you're shooting the Milky Way or the stars, as the camera can't focus in near darkness. The next big topic to discuss is light metering. You can choose the portion of the viewfinder image that will be used for metering. In the D7100 and in the D850, you can start with matrix. That's where the camera uses a wide area of the frame and sets exposure according to the tone distribution, the color, the light, and some distance information the camera discerns. Center weighted, the camera meters the entire frame, but assigns the greatest weight to the center of the frame. This is the normal or classic method for portraiture. In spot metering, the camera uses a small circle at the current focus point. This allows a subject that is much brighter or darker than the background to be properly exposed. If you have a modern DSLR like the D850, there is another choice called highlight weighted. In this mode, the camera assigns the greatest weight to highlights. This is useful to reduce loss of detail in highlights. For example, you're photographing spotlighted performers like a rock band on stage. There's going to be dark background, but the performers themselves will be very bright. So the highlight weighted mode uh, gives you a good chance of capturing the performers the way you'd like. Here are the icons as you scroll through the choices on a D7100. You press the metering button on the top of the camera and then rotate the main command dial. You may have noticed that under spot above it said the current focus point. You can choose the key point for focusing and metering. This is handy for the, if the subject for metering is not in the center of the frame. For now, set your camera to center weighted metering and center the focus point. You can try the other options at your leisure. Each has a good application. Now that we are focusing and metering according to our choice, let's go further. The term ISO refers to the sensitivity of the electronic sensor in the camera. This sensor is a small computer chip comprised of elements that can sense red, green, blue, and light intensity. The number of elements, called pixels, is now in the millions. 
Why is this important? Well, there are three parameters that influence exposure. Isosensitivity, shutter speed, and aperture. We're now going to address each of these. For most cameras, a good starting point for setting ISO is what is referred to as the native ISO. For many Nikon cameras, this is an ISO value of 100. Check your user's manual to see what your manufacturer recommends. Let's talk about stops. This is a somewhat anachronistic term, but it refers to how the parameters that influence exposure are measured. A doubling of the light at the meter or a halving of the light at the meter is one stop. Doubling is two times, halving of course is one half. Factors of two are the basis for stops. The ISO sensitivity can be set in stop and sub-stop increments. Typically a sub-stop is one-third of a stop, but don't sweat it. If the native ISO is 100 and we change the ISO to 200, we've moved one stop. The sensor is now two times as sensitive. If we change the ISO to 400, we've moved another stop. 800 is another, 1600 an another, and so on. It's all about twos. At some point, the sensor will not be able to function without showing noise in our images. This can be colored specks or general fuzziness of the image. Watch what happens here. The camera's on a tripod, the ambient light is constant, but we will make several changes to ISO, moving one stop at a time in manual mode so the camera doesn't compensate for the ISO change. Notice how the image gets brighter and brighter, but the image also gets fuzzier. Take notice that as I'm showing you the various photos, I have to turn off the display so that the command dial will allow me to change the ISO. There's oftentimes this kind of interaction between one state of the camera and another. Let's discuss shutter speed. The shutter opens and exposes the sensor to the light coming through the lens. At the end of the chosen time, the shutter closes and the capture of the light stops. Here's an older film camera where I can show you the action. It begins with the lens image hitting the mirror and being directed to the viewfinder. You can see my hand behind the camera in the mirror. When you press the shutter release, the mirror jumps out of the way and the front curtain opens. The film, or on our DSLR, the sensor, is now getting light from the lens. The rear curtain closes up to 30 seconds in length and as fast as 1 8,000th of a second. Let's start with an exposure time of 1 second. If we speed things up to 1 half second, we've moved 1 stop and 1 half the light will hit the sensor. At 1 quarter second, we've moved two stops from the starting value. At 1 8th, 1 15th, and 1 30th, we've moved three, four, and five stops from the starting position. Please note that the camera manufacturers don't have an exact doubling of every number. 1 8th doubled to 1 15th of a second on the camera. We can mix and match. For example, a change of ISO sensitivity from 100 to 200 increases sensitivity one stop. A change of shutter speed from 1 30th to 1 60th is half as long, which lets half the light into the sensor. Marrying the two changes together results in no change in the exposure. Do you get it? Two times one half is equal to one. 
one times anything has no effect. Be sure you understand this idea of compensating changes and modifying ISO and shutter speed to change the light to reach the sensor. Here's a sequence of setups where we're in aperture priority, that means the aperture is fixed, ISO 100 and 1 15th of a second. Notice that each time the ISO doubles, the shutter speed is cut in half. I left aperture as the third parameter. For starters, take a look at this lens. It's an older film era lens where aperture can be changed manually. Here are the focus ring, the zoom ring, and the aperture ring. Here's a modern lens with just focus and zoom ring. Here's that manual lens again. Do you see the small hole in the middle? I'm going to start with the lens at the smallest aperture. That's f22. Notice how it changes as I open the lens until the lens is fully open. Think about light like it was water. From a physics perspective, they actually behave similarly. Obviously, you can get more water through an open lens than one that is closed to a small orifice. Now, what gives a lot of people trouble is the nomenclature associated with aperture. I began with an aperture of f22. I then went one stop to f16, another to f11, another to f8, another to f56, and finally one more stop at f4. If this lens was more capable, the numbers would keep going to f2.8, 2.0, and then 1.4. The numbers in between those values are one-third stop value partial stops. Lenses with big glass, meaning they have small numbers for the maximum aperture, cost more and weigh more. At this point in our learning progression, almost any lens on your camera will be okay. So, where are we going with all this? You can adjust ISO up and down to adjust the sensitivity of the sensor. You can adjust the shutter speed. Think about the length of time the camera eye is open, longer or shorter, to adjust the light hitting the sensor. You can adjust the aperture to be larger or smaller to affect the amount of light to hit the sensor. All three of these possibilities can be adjusted together. Why would you want to? Well, the answer comes from how these parameters change the photo. The changes affect the photo differently. ISO affects the sensitivity of the electronics for the capture of the light. Shutter speed affects the capture of the ambient light and the degree of motion capture. Aperture affects the capture of the ambient light and the range of distance into the scene that is in focus. We are now talking about the most fundamental part of your artistic photographic journey. Let's talk about shutter speed first. Imagine you're photographing a stationary object. Shutter speed only matters in terms of overall ambient light control. Now let's imagine you're photographing a child riding a bike from left to right in front of you at 1 60th of a second exposure. If the child is riding at 10 miles an hour, he's going to move about one quarter foot during the time of our exposure. The blur that will result from this will be noticeable. If we decrease the exposure time to one one thousandth of a second, the child only moves less than two tenths of an inch. The resulting blur will be undetectable. We will have frozen the subject and they will appear sharp in the photo. The reverse of this procedure is often used in water photography, like a waterfall. At our starting point, 1 60th of a second exposure, 
the water will be mostly frozen, but there'll be a little bit of motion blur. But if we slow the exposure time to 1 15th or 1 quarter second, the moving white water will take on that fuzzy cotton candy appearance that many people like. Some people are confused by the shutter speed indications on their camera. It is typical that 30 with quote marks after it indicates 30 seconds. The numbers count down to a single second indicated by one with a quotation mark after it. The large fractions of a second, like one half, one third, one quarter, are often indicated by two, three, or four respectively with no quote marks after the number. No, no punctuation at all. As the fractions get smaller, they're indicated by whole numbers in a similar manner. For example, 100 indicates 1 one hundredth of a second and 500 indicates 1 five hundredth of a second. Now, when we're making these shutter speed changes, one or both of the other parameters need to make a corresponding change. We'll get to that in a moment. Now, let's hit the depth of field topic. Cameras can only focus over a certain range of distance from the camera. If I'm the camera, it might only be in focus from here to here or even shorter. Sometimes the range of focus is down to hundredths of an inch. That's not very much range. The range where the focus is acceptable is called the depth of field. With large apertures, the depth of field is shorter than that with smaller. The depth of field increases with greater distance from the camera to the subject. Just remember that going from an aperture of say f4 where the lens is fairly open to one f16 where it's very closed that increases the depth of field. The further you're focusing from your subject that also for the same settings increases the effective depth of field. You can download free apps for your smartphone that will perform depth of field calculations. Now we get to mixing and compensating for the choices of ISO, aperture, and shutter speed. Film was not very sensitive and its sensitivity could not be changed in the camera. You could do a little bit when you developed but it basically couldn't be changed. It's a wondrous time now that we can adjust ISO over a huge range in camera. Back in the film era, when cameras introduced internal light meters, the manufacturers gave the photographer two choices. You could set the aperture and the camera would make a corresponding selection of shutter speed, or you could set the shutter speed and the camera would make the corresponding selection of aperture. What we did in program mode was to allow the camera to select all three parameters. Modern DSLRs still have the choices the film photographers had. You can pick shutter priority or aperture priority after setting the ISO. Some modern cameras go a step further, but not all the way to program mode, by letting you select auto ISO on top of your selection of aperture or shutter priority. I trust that some demonstrations will aid your understanding. I'm going to set the camera on a tripod so it doesn't move. Let's set ISO to 100 and shutter priority to 1 8 second. The camera has chosen the widest setting for this lens at f 4.5. Here's a shot with the monkey just hanging still, followed by one with him swinging. Let's increase the shutter speed two stops to 1 30th second and ISO to 400. Here's the result. Now 
Let's increase shutter speed to 1 125th of a second and ISO to 1600. Here's the shot. Lastly, we increase shutter speed to 1 250th of a second and ISO to 3200. Notice how in each of the shots, good old monkey boy here, was increasingly frozen as we decreased the shutter opening time. Do you see the idea of compensating changes? Before going into depth of field, I would like to let you know that the camera manufacturers try to make aperture and shutter speed settings easy for us. Modern DSLRs typically increment shutter speed and aperture in one-third stop increments. When you change these parameters using the main command dial, the one on the rear, or the subcommand dial, the one on the front, you can count clicks to figure out how to change without looking. In manual mode, for example, three clockwise clicks on the main command dial is nullified by three counterclockwise clicks on the subcommand. This nullification move is useful if your exposure is okay, but you want to blur moving water more by slowing the shutter. The slower shutter will let more light in, so you need to compensate with a smaller aperture. Let's demonstrate depth of field. I'm photographing along the length of a yardstick. I'm beginning at ISO 100 and f2.8, and I'm focusing on the middle of the stick. You can see that at f2.8, the range where the numbers are in focus is pretty short. Let's go to f11. We need to change the ISO from 100 in the photo, but to what? Count yourself. 2.8, to 4, to 5.6, to 8, to 11. That's a change of four stops. So with this calculation, ISO needs to go from 100 to 200 to 400 to 800 to 1600. Let's take a second shot. You can see that the depth of field is greater, but the overall exposure is the same. A third shot at F22 shows that the depth of field is increased again. Now, sorry to say, with regard to remembering F2 to 2.8 to 4 to 5.6 to F8 to 11 to 16 to 22, you're just going to have to commit it to memory. Many shooters use aperture priority as their go-to choice. For stationary objects, this works wonderfully. If you're shooting motocross, car racing, kids riding bikes, or waterfalls, you probably will want to use shutter priority. It becomes your choice as to how you want to craft the photo. Do we freeze? Do we blur? Do we show everything in focus or only the bride's face where the groom behind her is blurred? This is where the art comes to life for you. Now, just like in part one, it's time for you to do some homework. In part one, you practiced in program mode. This time you should go out and try aperture priority shooting, then try shutter priority shooting, explore the compensatory changes that you make as you adjust back and forth, up and down, try a variety of stationary and moving subjects. I expect that you will see the incentive for shutter priority when the subject is moving and aperture priority when the subject is stationary. That's it for part two. We'll go into even greater depth, but in this part two, I wanted you to be able to go beyond program mode and explore the rich opportunity for making art in your photography with shutter and aperture priority work. I hope you enjoyed the video and learned something that will help you. Be sure and subscribe if you didn't already. It's right down there in the right hand uh, lower corner of the screen. And come back, check out part three next.